Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it's so nice to have everyone gathered here together for this really exciting artist talk. Um, my name is Alyssa Presida. I'm the executive director here at the Inuit Art Foundation. Uh, and we're so thrilled to be able to bring together this incredible group of artists uh, to talk about work that was installed at Nocturne uh, this past fall. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Inuit Art Foundation's main office is located on the ancestral and ter traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, this place is home to many, including a diverse urban Indigenous community of Inuit First Nations and Métis folks. Uh, and I'm joined by so many other fantastic people on this call. Uh, and so what I think we can get started with is uh, going around for a bit of introduction. So I think I will start with one of this project's co-curators, Dr. Heather Igloliorty. Ooh, could No, it's morning for me, but not for you. I'm on the I'm on the West Coast. <laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Heather Igloliorty, as Alyssa just said, and I'm one of the co-curators on this project. I'm um, in Oak Newfoundlander from Nunatsiavut. And I recently moved to the University of Victoria. So I'm here and next to me is Malaya. Hi, uh, my name is Malaya Maloney. I'm coming to you today from unceded Coast Salish territories, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Next to me is Erin. And I'm on traditional Denino homelands here in Anchorage, Alaska. I am a carver, interdisciplinary artist, and student, and I'm so grateful to join you all. Hi, my name is Sakalik Partridge. I am an artist, curator, and writer originally from Kupchak, Nunavik, currently based on unceded Algonquin territory in Ottawa. Hi there, uh, Unusakut, Jamesy Yunga, Titikau Tiyu Yunga, Inulunga. My name is Jamesy. I'm from uh, the Northwest Territories originally, from uh, Nunetsiak. And uh, I am a uh, writer and an artist, and I come from you today in Toronto. Hi, my name is Koko Epumwakle. I am an artist, I'm mainly an illustrator, um, and I'm from Nook Greenland. Um, but today here in Copenhagen, Denmark. In a very different time zone. So thank you for staying up late to join us. And last but certainly not least today, uh, Aha. Hi, I'm from Ikalotutia, Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. My name is Aha Lingyak Ohoknak, or referred to as Aha. Um, I'm an artist, researcher, and curator, and I worked as an assistant curator on this project with these wonderful individuals. Nice to meet you all. And I think you are uh, on a residency yourself today, joining us all the way from Winnipeg. I'm working on some stuff here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting, thanks so much for making the time. Um, so I think uh, one of the things that would be great to start off talking about is uh, where the idea or sort of the origins of this project uh, came about and then We'll certainly get into all of the fun details of how it came together and what it looked like and hear from all the artists about your experiences. Um, but Heather, uh, this really came out of an incubator uh, idea from uh, that Inuit Futures, uh, your partnership grant uh, really started. And so do you want to talk a little bit about where that came from? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, shout out to Dr. Carla Taunton, our other co-curator, uh, Dominic, Matt, Yifon, and all the other folks that helped us as we were um, working on these projects in the beginning. Uh, not everybody could be here on the call with us today, but uh, we're certainly instrumental in creating this project. So we, through Inuit Futures and my Canada Excellence Research Chair, we were able to organize a uh, a workshop in Halifax that also included a group of uh, Mi'kma'ki based artists who were working on a separate Atlantic Indigenous incubator at the same time. And we were in CMAID, which is the center for, I didn't look it up before this. <laughs> Intermedia Arts. Intermedia Arts, Decolonial and Intermedia Arts. Yes. And uh, so we were hosted um, at, a at a research lab at NASCAD University. 
And we were very fortunate to have a week together last summer in July, and then again in October before the Nocturne Night Festival, which uh, supported the project through um, through uh, uh, on-site visits, museum tours, galleries, and uh, all kinds of events that took place throughout the summertime and then again in the fall. So um, what happens during an incubator is we get together a bunch of artists, some of whom had never met each other before, almost everybody. Um, and for this particular artist incubator, we brought together artists working in a variety of different medias from uh, from the written word to sculptural practices to uh, installation, mixed media, and some digital arts, digital graphic design, and brought together a group of artists from across Inuit Inanga as well, from Alaska straight through to Greenland, in order for everyone to come together and work on a project that they designed based on a really kind of a broad theme. I'm going to ask you, Alyssa, to to jump back in and just talk about what so we uh, Alyssa and I and Carla had a sort of a pre-planning trip in Halifax and the idea came it started out of one place and moved to another but basically we were like I went to art school in Halifax I went to NASCAD as an undergrad student and Carla teaches there now and so we were driving around the city and pointing out landmarks in Halifax to Alyssa and they were all so <laughs> I do think it is worth explaining this because it is it was very unexpected. Um, I, yes, I had never been in Halifax before. It was my first time. And for those who don't know me super well, uh, you it may help to know that I love spooky things. Like, I am definitely a Halloween person. And so we were sitting in the Halifax Public Library um, talking about possible installation sites for different these different projects. And so... Um, the the folks from Nocturne would sort of suggest like, oh, uh, what about uh, Grand Parade? And then Carla would turn to me uh, helpfully, like very helpfully, trying to say like, that's by the graveyard that you passed on your way here. Or uh, they would say, or, or it would get thrown out like, well, what about this space? It was like, is the one with the morgue or the one that had the explosion where people died? <laughs> like it was just, it was constant. And I was like, what is happening right now? Um, <laughs> you loved it. <laughs> I did. I was so excited. And so we walked outside and I sort of said to you, like, I know that we're not really, I'm not really involved in this, but like, it's everything here is so spooky. Like the theme has to be spooky something, right? And so uh, you were pretty into that. <laughs> Nocturne is also takes place the week before Halloween. And so we were also thinking about the context of it being, you know, that time of year in a place that has such a long history. Halifax being the oldest city in North America really got us thinking about hauntings and ghosts and uh, specters and, and things that are things that are scary. And so when we got the incubator together, I think that um, the artists, of course, took over and, and very quickly that conversation around things that were scary and then, like things that are frightening turned to some of the lived realities of what's happening in the North right now. And of course, all around the world, but um, you know, like a conversation around what is scary to Inuit, I think quickly turned to what's happening right now in climate change. So I don't know if any of the artists like to jump in and talk a little bit about that initial incubator and how that idea came together. I mean, we did kind of uh, set it up, but not in the direction that we thought we were setting it up because we started with an amazing um, haunted hike of Halifax and then learned more about the history of the region. And then, um, but then uh, I think kind of quickly shifted to um, something really compelling for Inuit all around the circumpolar world. Jamesy, you work in horror. <laughs> you were, uh, maybe we'll start with a little bit about your practice and um, what you brought to the incubator. I think like initially, yeah, I was, uh, I was unsure kind of a little bit about what my role would be to this. I thought maybe I would function more in kind of in a writing capacity. So I know we got to go on that horror trip and got kind of freaked out as we had a bunch of jump scares and we learned all the creepy uh, stories behind uh, Halifax. And then as we got set down, we got to have a kind of a ghost telling story one night as we kind of got into the mood a little bit about these things, kind of the themes that we found a little bit uh, upsetting, sorry, upsetting as we we're kind of looking at, yeah, the climate change anxiety started, those ideas started to kind of pop up and like how would we be able to kind of approach those things. 
at least I think that's how that's how it kind of started up and they were wondering about what would because you know looking at it from a kind of a northern Inuit uh, point of view the kind of that voice kind of seems to be uh, missing sometimes so being able to have that dialogue was something I think that we wanted to be able to express somehow in one way so the idea I guess incubated. I think there was a lot of um, commonality between your written work and maybe some of Coco's work as well. Coco, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your practice? I think that I, I know that it was actually Alyssa's idea to invite your you to the residency because you'd just been featured in Inuit Art Quarterly, I think maybe the month before or a couple of months before, and your work just seemed like a really great fit. Oh, yeah, like, um, yeah, I've worked on on monster uh, books that are based in Inuit culture and um, I think we all like kind of found out at some point that it would be a very interesting uh, what do you call it um, main source to to also use for for this kind of climate change and try to what do you call it um, uh, braid those things together um yeah I <laughs> I'm not too like as you can already see I'm not too well speaking with a lot of people even though it's just to you guys or uh, knowing that there's a lot of people I'm, I get very sweaty and yeah nervous <laughs> so excuse me <laughs> totally understood but I'm sure I can I can assure you uh you are among lots of friends here but also lots of fans uh of from folks who are watching. Um, Tacker, like you also have a spoken word practice uh, as well as all the other kinds of multi multidisciplinary work that you do. And I remember when we approached you to participate with the theme, I think you were initially a little hesitant, um, but I think really embraced it in the end. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I wasn't having the greatest time. <laughs> that's what no before before going there and I was like oh why did they why did they bring me here <laughs> a little bit like Jamie said I was like what what can I contribute um but then you know I guess the idea is you throw people in a room and then they start talking and they come up with stuff and I think that's what really happened it's like nobody has a clear answer about when is the moment that we uh, came up with the the idea because it sort of evolved as we were working on it too um but I think we all, we got along well. And um, for me, it was a great experience. Um, but for the spoken word part, I was thinking, um, you know, that would be nice to have all of our voices as part of the work. Um, just from experience, I, I really like the aspect of group work where, where different elements from people, from all the participants are part of the work and especially different voices. Um, so we did some random stuff and we got put together by Dominic and I think it turned out okay. <laughs> uh, I think that I, that's, that's a, a great place to kind of segue here. So what, what, um, the artists all started working towards was, um, was kind of developing personas around Arctic animals that, and and perhaps their perspectives on climate change. And Aaron, I'm going to call on you because I'm I'm hoping you have the mask next to you and, and like where the where that kind of spiraled out from. Because certainly once we started on that part of the conversation, Aaron's work was really um, inspiring and I think kind of instrumental on on where we started to take things in the in the artistic direction. Do you have it with you, or is it it's somewhere else? Oh yeah, great. Please. Yeah. Um, so. One of the things that I tangibly brought <laughs> to the to the incubator was one of my carved masks, this one in particular. Um, this is my first Noctic mask. It's from 2012, so it's very old. Um, and um, as a as a carver, I I had I also questioned what I could bring into such a short period of time with being together. Like, how could I carve? in one week. <laughs> um, and I realized I couldn't. So I brought, you know, what, what I, what I keep with me. And this is, um, one of my first masks. And so it, it holds a lot of reverence for me and my work. And so, um, 
for me, like knowing that I can bring this and we can somehow translate it. And that was the question to me, like, how do I translate what I have into something that we can all engage with? And so in the first incubator, um, with the very generous assistance from Jordan Hill, we um, scanned my mask and created a mock-up of a digital printing of it here. Um, and so that is part of the process that we engaged in in that space that really formulated this idea that we could all be making masks for these representations, which to me really speak of this process of story making, as well as this engaging in this sort of um, visual poem that would be um, would immerse these beings. Um, because to me, like we were creating representations of, of fear which is um, something that exists across the new, new Not Right. We all had our own stories about representations of fear that always engage with our wild relatives as well as notions of place. And so we kind of worked together to create um, a version of that that we each got to voice and um, be able to participate in this space together. I think prototyping the mask and then 3D scanning them was what really kind of opened up the inspiration for the project because then we could we could imagine ways that all of the artists could design things in their own style and yet we would create a kind of a unified appearance to the works. We're going to look at them in just a minute. Yeah, I agree. I think that um it was it was totally open at first, which I know can be really uh, intimidating, but also exciting. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Aaron's mask really grounded so much of the the way forward. Malaya, this was your first time in an incubator and in this kind of setting. Um, how did how was that process for you? Ooh, and also like getting in the studio and getting to do the yeah. recordings. I'd love to let's talk a little bit about that part of it before we show it. Um. Yeah. So. Firstly, I'd say my artistic practice is like one word I'd describe it is recycled. Um, I like using different materials. I like, and it experimental, but I honestly didn't know what I was going to bring to this group because I, when I got the invitation, my jaw dropped. I was like, oh my goodness, I get to work and hang out and make art with people that I look up to, like genuinely have like interest in supporting. So I hope my energy was kind of contagious for everybody because I know I have lots of good memories. Um, like for example, where Heather was leading to was in the studio. I didn't think I'd like the studio. I thought that would be the scariest part, but actually I loved it. I think I spent the longest time in there <laughs> out of everyone with the dawn. Um, not that, that matters. We just got carried away. I, I wanted to find like the perfect voice for bee woman, which is really hard because bees aren't just the, the, the. So it was about trying to find like the narrative voice and also like the mask's voice. And also the perfect scream. <laughs> <laughs> or whispered <laughs> or growled yeah shout out again to Dom Thibault and Danielle Miles and then also Leah Dector for hosting us there I think that uh, once once the the group of artists had decided on a seal a bee a bear a caribou a raven like all of these different perspectives then it, it really became possible for everyone to start thinking about like, what is their worldview? What is their perspective on this? Like, how are they experiencing climate change from their distinct perspectives? Uh, I think we might be um, getting- hey, Danielle, do you mind pulling up the- it. Thank you. Um, so these are- this... Sorry, oh, go, go ahead, Heather. <laughs> you go ahead. Uh, so this is everybody, the whole team at Nocturne. Uh, well not the whole team, I'm realizing. Some people are not in this photo, but this is a lot of folks uh, who were part of the team here at the installation. So this was, uh, it was a lot of prototyping um, of the of the works here. I think this was a test that we were doing the week prior to Nocturne. So just so it's clear for everybody, 
Uh, we came together initially for a week in the summer, and then we came back uh, the week before Nocturne to finish um, fabrication and then to test all the equipment. So this is uh, Dominic Tibbold and uh, Matt Brulot are, are really excellent technicians trying to figure out if the giant amounties that everyone had been sewing all week would work effectively as screens for the video projections uh, and if the sound would work as well, um, which was really exciting and also a little bit scary <laughs> at times. Tacherlik had had brought in this template from something that she works through in her own practice, uh, but we scaled it from, you know, basically life size to about 12 feet tall, as you can see in this photo, first using um, some building materials and then deciding to move on to canvas at a later date, but it was a lot of fun and also a little bit chaotic trying to figure out what was going to work and doing so like scaling up a pattern, just using duct tape <laughs> and paper, I think, uh, and then trying to figure it out. You can see here that we are um, really just trying different ways because of course there was a soundscape that was done in Dolby 5.1 that had to be to kind of go around the whole installation space, which if you're familiar with Halifax, the back to public library uh, that uh, Melody, Melanie Nugent Noble had set up for us that site uh, is massive. And so we needed to coordinate um, the five channels of video works that you're about to see, as well as uh, the sound coming from each piece so that it seemed like um, every work was was alone, but also in a kind of a chorus together. Here you see us on site. And we should thank Brian uh, here for helping us try to figure out how to get these massive structures to stand I up. I mean, check out Aaron's mask in the background of this photo. It's just like, I think once we, once Brian dropped off that, uh, that initial mask and we got a sense of the scale and like how these pieces were going to come together at all, you can see in the other photo there that it, it started to really feel like we had, um, we were zeroing in on something. Let's see Fawn in the, with the hacksaw on site. And oh, go mounting, mounting uh, very large structures. How did it, I mean, I'd love to open it up to all the artists about how it felt that week as, as we were really fabricating um, pieces in, at this gigantic scale or to see your masks for the first time 3D printed like six feet tall basically. Um, I think like it was really quite something to be able to see like when all the different elements came together, like we had the mask and then the amounties and then being able to see them put up and then having the music and then the lighting and the video projected once it all the different elements came together and you're like, wow, you realize this is what it is that we had all been working towards and things. that kind of cemented it seeing that vision coming up for me. Yeah. Anybody For else? me, it was really exciting. I um, like the idea because I work with uh, kind of clothing design as uh, installation work or sculptural work, and it was exciting to see them come together as if they have some kind of presence. That's always the moment where I feel like something is is done well is when you feel like this the thing has its own identity kind of and um the masks really really did it of course it's just um i don't know it's 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 really interesting to be next to them they're so big i never made anything so big um so that was a really fun aspect of it for my experience, yeah, it was really just very exciting to adjust the dimensions of my work. Like, like I said, like going from this to creating something that was, you know, feet <laughs> within the feet dimensions um, really adjusted this, this element of scale and this addition of these installation elements really, really changed things. I had spent some time the summer before studying with a totem pole carver and talking about the concept of monumental work. And it's very different to just talk about it and then to do it because these things were 
in a monumental scale. And that was so exciting to have created something that um, big in such a short time frame with people I'd never worked with before. It was so exciting to get that done and then to to see it come alive for that night, which was wild. Yeah, I find it I found it very exciting. Um, it was it was very interesting to see the entire pro process uh, the week going up to the uh, the outdoor exhibition or um the what do you call it the the for the art festival um we also got to to do a lot of bonding through all this labor of love and i think it really paid off in the end i i was very um i found it to be like i i can't, almost can't put it into words but it was like both exciting and also like uh, it daunted on me like we just did all of this um in a very small time like frame of time so yeah to me it was I loved it <laughs> every bit of it um especially all the bonding we got to do because because that was uh, incredible for for the amount of time we just had to do it together Malaya, how did it feel when you saw when you saw the woman? <laughs> well, if I remember this correctly, I believe the woman was the last to be printed. And so I was so anxious. I was like, what if it looks terrible, blown up? Because of course the original is much smaller. Um, but once I came in and like we're kind of midway through our week there in October, I was like, okay, I'm actually really proud of us because a lot of us stretched like beyond our personal like artistic boundaries more in like support but also just it was for the project like it all had to come together somehow but I know that like what we made is like it's so grand it's so big and I think the message echoes that perfectly which I hope everyone gets to hear a little later yeah, I think we're, I think it's time that we show a little clip. So I will, the caveat is that this is non-professional documentation and also a prototype for a bigger project. I think our our hope is that we're going to turn this into uh, a 360 film that could be shown in a headset or in a virtual space, as well as continuing to install this work in person. And so the the masks and a Mountie are being... Uh, created right now and are going to be shipped out to me at the University of Victoria, where we're hoping to work with some Inuit filmmakers to turn this 360 into a reality and also um, to to work through the soundtrack and like prototype it again and have all the artists um, sort of finalize where we are at, because as as we we're saying, this is the result of a of a short but very intensive incubator that I think produced some really incredible work in you know, the span of about five days of production in the beginning and then five days of production at the end, including like all of the building, all of the figuring it out, all of the rigging. It's it's really an incredible uh, achievement. So, Daniel, would you press play and we can all. very small short snippet on my on my phone so I'm sorry the quality wasn't uh wasn't more exciting but it gives you a sense of both the the sort of scale of the works the space and then the complexity of the actual installation so we have the video projections that all of the artists work with Nat to do yeah please keep playing it Daniel go right ahead <laughs> as well as the 5.1 uh, surround um, soundscape. And so uh, I believe that um, the throat singing that's Tagalog and Acha that was recorded at NASCAD, is that right? Amazing. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna raise the fact that Acha actually contributed to the soundtrack as well. So they were there as an artist too. <laughs> and I think you submitted um, images that were used in the video, right? 
Yeah. Danielle, can we see some of the close-ups? I think that would help us as well as we're, oh, wow, there we go. So that's Bee Woman's um, incredible mask, Coco and the transforming Nanook. Aaron's incredible Nachik. Tuk Tu. What you can't see there is the barbed wire kind of around the antlers very well, <laughs> but very cool. Firmly in Jamesy's horror wheelhouse. <laughs> then uh, Raven, the Tucker look. Um, Aha, we haven't heard much from you, though. You were so integral into the process. Like, can you, I mean, especially because you went to NASCAD, you knew Halifax so well. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was definitely an install challenge. <laughs> I will note they were invited to be an artist, but they have, yes. they had a carpal tunnel <laughs> yeah, straight injury. That. So like I'm veering away from my typical like um, art mediums, which was painting and drawing. So I mostly just assisted while I was there in what I could. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the artists like all worked so well um, in like figuring things out and like, just having those first meetings and being able to see the space like I think like the ideas just really bloomed while we were there um yeah yeah it was really amazing to see we do have a question uh from the audience and please uh if folks are are who, for folks who are watching please do submit your questions in the Q&A um uh, Amanda is asking um if this inspired any of the artists to think about permanent public art projects uh, or these sort of monumentally scaled projects. And I just want to say shout out to Amanda Shore, original Inuit Futures coordinator many years ago. <laughs> was with us for about a year before uh, moving back to Halifax. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for your question. So public art, and I think also public art, but also like where where do you or has that being a part of this project inspired you to work in different ways or had you are you looking at things in a different way now for me it's always um because you know i like to do lots of different things it's always uh being given permission to do something new and being given the opportunity i think that's one of the things that was so great about this project was that we all had the opportunity was it Aaron who was saying, or is it Malaya, to sort of go outside our, our regular boundaries. Um, I would love to do public art, but I feel like I need to, I would need to do it in, in a way that is supported because I don't know about materials or about regulations or anything like that. So, I mean, this is like a first kind of foray into that beyond just the gallery. I could try and answer from my side of things. Like I've never done anything like this before. And so me, to me, it was a very, it was a huge learning experience to do something outside of me sitting in an office drawing <laughs> or writing or uh, anything with it. Like I usually just sit <laughs> and work. So for me, it was quite the experience. And as uh, Takalik said, it's it feels like you almost have to get permission to do something outside of uh, outside of books or uh, exhibitions or galleries or anything um i did briefly think about doing uh, street art for for a moment but then again it's still like permission and stuff um but it was really nice to do something outside of my comfort zone in regards to uh, where my art would be shown. Um, and it also felt like I I was giving permission to, uh, or not just permission, but it felt like um, doing Inuit art, because I, I usually never really see so too many people do that kind of stuff, that it was very, um, it's okay, you can do this. It's it's more than like it is uplifting a, a culture which I I always wanted to do and it just reaffirmed that maybe I should keep doing that kind of stuff. So that is my kind of answer. Yeah, that's great. Malaya, did you also want to speak to this? 
Yeah, I was just going to say it inspired me to think bigger. Like, I I think in my little apartment, in my own little practice, it's really easy to like think, oh, no, I'm, I can't do that. But this project and what it allowed us to do was so exciting. I didn't think we'd be installing 12 foot, 10, 12 foot beings downtown, a big city. I mean, smaller city, but Halifax. Um, yeah, I'll just say we can we can make bigger art, and it doesn't need to be just on paper or online. Plus, you discovered that you're a sculptor. I think the same with Jamesy. He uh -huh. did, not made really visual art in a public context before. No, no, this is my uh, my first uh, outing going out and making like a. Yeah, I guess public art, but also like it felt good to be again, like getting pushed out of your comfort zone and creating like something visual art. And again, the feeling that feeling like, oh, yeah, this is something that I'm allowed to do. And so I had a lot of fun, like not just like visual art, but actually like working with your hands again. I was going back and watching some of the videos on my phone of all of us sitting down there and just like mass producing, doing all the sewing with the sewing machines, creating those huge amounts and all of us kind of working together and collaborating. And that was that was so much fun and yeah it, it made me realize that like, this is something to be able to kind of pursue that and not only that is that because we did visually and we were all kind of writing our own monologues and we all got to act them at the same time with the emphasis and kind of spitball ideas of one another and then uh, also like seeing visually like seeing how matt and dom like created the soundscapes and the visual poetry and the the kind of montages and the, the art films that get, went along with each of these and so since then, it's helped influence my practice when I'm script writing or creating dialogue and kind of just art in different ways. I may think back in this, it made me realize like what is actually possible. And so it's fun. It's helped me grow uh, what I'm trying to say is it with the, the various mediums that I'm working. That's awesome. I, it's it, I think it also it kind of brings home how much of the like peer to peer sharing and mentorship that was happening laterally across the group at the same time. I mean, Tucker like doing the the cutting, the patterning <laughs> for all of these massive pieces, and then everyone pitching in. And because like you cannot as a one person sew one of these, you know, massive three meter tall amount. To, you need you need to, like a two person operation. So coming into the space and seeing everyone like all hands on deck <laughs> working together was really incredible. We're also super fortunate to have uh, Jordan Hill in the studio space with us the whole time. He is a brilliant media artist who's based in Halifax right now, but from out where I am right now in the Kwangan territory. And um, having him on site to also be a part of the troubleshooting and thinking about the digital aspects of the project while he was working on uh, other things at the same time was, I think, really inspiring. And so it's so helpful to be in CMAID and on NASCAD where there's so much, we're in that maker space. There were so many opportunities for us that it really helped us to kind of expand in new directions, like just having a professional sound studio on site and editing suites and everything else meant that the action all took place together, which I think was really enabled it to come together so quickly in such a good way. Erin, you're in an MFA program now. Is that, am I right about that? Yes, I am in the last semester of my graduate studies um, at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, and so this project took place while, <laughs> while I was in school, which is really exciting. Um, but it's also been super inspiring and very formative for me as someone who's working towards a thesis exhibition that um, I got to be a part of this project because it really um, allowed me to have this space and really provided an invitation for me to engage in um, so many different artistic territories that we all occupy and all have so much skill in um, and to be able to extend that invitation and welcome and try to um, provide what I can to instruct about creating sculptural works and work with everyone in that aspect was super exciting too um yeah this the collaboration and the levels of of intent and consent that we worked through in this process was so wonderful to have and get through in a creative collaboration because um 
in my experiences in between those spaces, sometimes things get, they get so muddled, um, but there was really this consensus process that we worked through that was so helpful, I think, um, and really created a good foundation for what we were able to do. Yeah, we, we came in so open-ended and like there wasn't even a rule that you all had to make the same work or that it had to be a big collaborative kind of a piece, but it was just like over time as and, the, and through discussion that it kind of came together how it was all going to work out, which was, you know, incredibly fortunate and synergetic for all of us. As we are, we're heading towards the last 15 minutes now, we're getting a question asking if we can ask what the inspiration was behind each of you choosing the being that you chose. It's a great one. Let me think back. Um, I'm pretty sure we like we made a list. Yes, we did make a list on Google Sheets or Google Docs. And we kind of all put in two or three names um, or stories that we're fans of. And I don't know, I think the last 2023 was such a big bug year. And I was really into like big sunglasses. And in my head, I thought, ooh, I could make a funky bee. So that was kind of my inspiration. Um, but also I was thinking about what my experience was like, especially as a kid on the tundra. And like seeing a bee and how it bounced um, and how it looks so giant, that was kind of like where the root of my vision came for Bee Woman. Yeah, to me, it was important to uh, find an animal that really represented uh, Greenland. And I know like from, um, from all, like uh, all kind of imagery in Greenland have a lot of... Uh, polar bears in them um and to me it's it seemed right to me and also to to go back in some of the old stories about transforming uh, animals that goes from humans to animals and then back again yeah, and I found that very intriguing and wanted to use that uh, to design the mask and the creature itself um because it just it seemed right <laughs> well uh yeah so i had chosen uh tuktu there the caribou to uh talk about and so when we had started out that's kind of what i like to do with my writing kind of the horror aspect of it is take like kind of uh natural kind of forces that are uh, maybe can be a little bit uh, threatening and whatnot and kind of update them into a different context and so when i started thinking about caribou i started thinking about because we're looking at it from a climate change angle and I've been thinking a lot about migration routes being uh, disturbed by like, industrial development and resource extraction. And uh, also in, uh, back in the Northwest Territories as well, the wildfires and everything was happening as well. And so we had this kind of danger of fire and danger of development. And I kept on thinking about this uh, caribou and you know, under so much danger and also having a family through the generations and trying to escape all that so i created this uh caribou uh, skull mask i was trying to find a way to make it look more human where it's just like a human face with like antlers coming out of it but the more i kind of sketched that out more odd it seemed and so i started doing that and making the the plaster cloth mask version of it and i was trying to think what could i use for teeth and i found all these jagged pieces of uh screws and whatnot and one day we're changing the light bulb in uh in uh at my cousin's place and i said wouldn't it be funny if i took this old light bulb and i put it right in the eye socket and sure enough it brought it to life the kind of dead life i guess you could say and then i could hear his their their voice behind it so that's that's where my tuck two came barbed wire tuck two came from um so actually my husband is i would say he's a sami artist designed my mask for me after my specifications <laughs> because I ran out of time but uh, the thing with the raven is uh, I'm always fascinated with birds I do beadwork around birds I've done also um, a beadwork piece about the white raven so the white raven is a figure that appears in Inuit stories all over the place across the north 
And the thing that's been happening lately, even after our, not before, but after our event in October is there's a white raven in Anchorage and I'm sure you know about this, but I, did, I don't know if you know that like Inuit all over the place on Facebook, of course, are going crazy about this white raven because it appears in traditional stories that when the right white raven comes, something significant will happen. Um, you know, some kind of change. So for me, it represents change, you know, and even like people posting complaining uh, things about uh, the raven, like, come on, everybody calm down. It's just a raven, that kind of thing. Like even that comment shows that it is that significant that there's this white raven in Anchorage. There's even, there's a Facebook page you can go to and you can follow all the photos and sightings of it. Um, but for me, it's always been an important figure. And of course, our sculptures are not meant to be any specific color. The white is just is just the kind of material that it's, it's sculpted out of and you can just read onto it whatever color you want. But for me, white raven is um, quite significant. Yeah, absolutely. And and Aaron, I know um, we were all inspired by your Natchik mask. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little about what drew you to, to the seal originally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Natchik has always been important to me. It has always been um, an important presence, an important gift that I get to, that I've gotten to be around my whole life in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, this mask was carved in like 2012, quite a, almost <laughs> over 10 years now um, ago while I was an undergrad at the University of Alaska Fairbanks at the Native Art Center there. And um, the intention and, and feeling with, with this work has always been to represent, yes, this presence, this benevolent presence that exists in the North um, Seals have given us so much as Inupiaq people. They provide for us um, the material that that houses us and clothes us. They provide sustenance and they provide um, tools that have allowed us to um, to have light in the north through seal oil lamps. And so, working on this piece is always it had always. Um, been with this concept of, of reverence and honoring um, and being able to translate that um, today and um, in, the, in, in a different context uh, with this felt experience of climate change um, because Natchik have been displaying these ecological environmental changes in their populations here in Alaska um, in the past several years, there have been mortality events and die-offs that Natchik have been showing us um, these changes to, to the world um, that we live in up here. And so it really directed to this, this really true felt experience of what is happening here in Alaska and what is happening to Natchik um, and how we need to uh, interact with that and be aware of the stories that our wild relatives are telling us. Yeah, I think I can speak for people who were there. Um, although I I was very close to the project, obviously it was it was really uh, incredibly impactful to see it in person. Um, and even I don't know if all of you felt that way that like we knew what it was going to be, but to actually see it happen and to be surrounded by the sound, you could just saw saw people just sort of come and stand and contemplate and think for a really long time. Uh, and I think that message around um, you know, we talked a lot about the idea of these beings as also like harbingers of, you know, like, uh, and what did we want it to be a warning or, you know, to inspire. And I think people really, my sense was that people in the audience really, really felt that um, from seeing the piece. And hopefully more people will as we, as we tour it around. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't um, super, it wasn't the, the the entire piece runs for, I think, about six minutes. And so what we saw was just a 20 second clip, but it it starts as kind of individual voices and very kind of slow and quiet. You just hear like a, like a kind of a, a melting drip and then it builds to a crescendo and, and becomes like very uh, like staccato in, in the 
in the soundscape as well as in the visual scape what's happening and then it kind of goes to a darkness again and comes up so it's like it's a very powerful um installation i was going to call it a performance <laughs> they're not they're not moving but it's a very powerful installation um that i think really tries to bring home just what aaron was saying about understanding um what what they're what we're trying to be told you know we've got polar bears being found with trash in their systems we've got you know everyone knows about the uh dire straits for bee population we're worried about the oceans and uh what's happening in the air as well so i think that it really tries to bring home just how fragile our ecosystem is but also how uh the arctic ecosystem protects the world and needs protection Malaya says, I remember seeing folks stay and watch our installation loop a couple of times, and that felt really good, having people be interested in the full experience. Yeah, and I, I think it's going to grow. I, we're definitely looking for future venues to bring this piece to and other ways to bring it as well. It's quite a large installation, so I think a logical next step is to get it into some, um, some headsets so that we can also bring it to community and share this work in the North as well as across Southern Canada and around the world. I think that's really um, another critical dimension is making sure that it's accessible to a lot of people. And so we'll be working on that this year and uh, looking forward to seeing where this develops. Hi, Jordan, welcome. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Oh God, I wasn't expecting that. Um, <laughs> well, there's no camera. That was rude. So. Cool. Uh, yeah, I thanks for it's a joy listening, seeing you all actually, uh, your faces. But um, yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, I don't think there was enough emphasis. Coco kind of touched on it, but the sheer difficulty it is to meet people for the first time and then come up with a project immediately, and I think that speaks a lot to um, just uh all of our backgrounds and our upbringing being so similar despite being across the world or the continent and um, how seamless it was even feeling like an honorary member of your group as well. Um, <laughs> just how quickly those relationships developed and, and how much stronger the work was for that. And, and I think it was really interesting watching such diverse personalities um, mesh uh seamlessly like almost immediately um and it was kind of a special product to to watch and and i'm sure this incubator um has kind of developed relationships that will hopefully last a lifetime and and for future collaborations but uh yeah i just it was it's so cool to just watch it all happen and watch you all kind of navigate those um those usually difficult dynamics but you made it look easy so kudos to you thanks so much jordan we i think we all were really appreciative and, and glad to have you there and just to be a part of all of those conversations it was a kind of a wild time there was like a flood and there was like all kinds of things happening at the same time and so uh, we, I think we all really appreciated everyone's ability to just be present and to get in and do the work. It's certainly not the last incubator that's going to be coming out of my research chair. It's just getting started. I've got eight years of this program and I just want to express my gratitude for uh, setting things on this really great trajectory and also providing, I've learned so much from watching you all work and how to sort of generate this kind of collaborative spirit inside of a space. So I'm so, so grateful to all of you, to my co-curators, Alyssa and Carla, and to all of the coordination uh, assistance that we had to bring this all together and to get everyone to Canada, <laughs> like to get everyone to Halifax, which is, you know, not the easiest place in the country to get to. So, and I, I know certainly for Coco and Aaron, that's a long way to come <laughs> to work in a, in a incubator space. So deeply appreciative um, for all of you and your participation and to... Um, I've got to shout out Danielle Miles again for coordinating all of this trip. This was her like 
her final big event before moving on to a new career opportunity. So we were very grateful to have her on board for all of that and, uh, and all of you. It's exactly on the minute. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Appreciate all the artists for coming in and speaking with us. If you're interested in the installation, you can reach out. I'm very easy to find by email uh, or the Inuit Art Foundation. You can reach I was out. Gonna say to you can uh, stay tuned to the Inuit Art Quarterly as we cover uh, the evolving uh, future installations and and uh, methods of uh, showing this project um and on all of these artists incredible careers uh so thank you all so much for joining us and it's it's so great to see everybody again and talk about this really incredible piece that you all put together uh, it's such a such a joy to be a very very small part of it so thank you thank you melanie and nocturne for supporting us as we brought this big crazy project together <laughs> super appreciate it